Hi, and welcome to a PowerPoint presentation I'm going to talk you through called Teaching Grammar Lexically. Okay, um, it might not sound like an obvious title because I think when lots of people think about the idea of lexis, they basically just think about it as meaning vocabulary or sort of vocabulary plus vocabulary deluxe or something. And I can understand why that's one way people think about it, but it's not the way I've come to think about it. Um, for me, there's a strange kind of parallel between my own teaching career and the lexical approach seen here. Um, my old dog-eared, battered LTP copy. Because um, both of us were, were born, uh, myself as a teacher, and the lexical approach, the book by Michael Lewis, were born 20 years ago in 1993. I started teaching in April 93 and the lexical approach came out sometime around then. Um, excuse me, I'm drinking a cup of tea whilst I'm doing this talk. Um, but I didn't actually read it myself until 1995 when I did my Delta. And to say that it came as a bit of a shock would be an understatement, I think, because really, for me, the way I think about the lexical approach is First and foremost, it's an approach to language. It's a, a way of thinking about what language is, how language works, how we remember language, how we learn language, um, how language is stored in the brain, all of these things. Um, and when I first read it, I think, it was a real challenge to the way that I'd been taught to teach. Because probably like many, many, many other teachers out there, perhaps like you listening to this now, the way that I'd been taught to teach was very much to focus on PPP, uh, you know, the tyranny of PPP. Um, for those of you who don't know it, it's that idea of presenting a discrete individual grammar structure to the students, um, maybe drawing a timeline, maybe giving a target sentence, a little explanation maybe, sort of setting it in a context, asking some concept questions then getting students to practice using it in a kind of controlled way, um, you know, doing a kind of controlled exercise, maybe a, a photocopied page from Raymond Murphy's English Grammar in Use, and then getting students to produce it, usually in a, a fairly contrived, fairly tightly controlled kind of way. And really, from when I first started teaching, when I did my, my four-week CELTA, um, C. Tefler, as it was called back then. When I did my first course, I was very, very much taught to think about teaching as being essentially PPP. And this was really based on Chomsky and the whole idea of structuralist grammar. Okay, And uh, yeah, I, I didn't realise at the time, but I've increasingly come to realise now it's a, an outmoded and outdated way of thinking about grammar and thinking about how language works. This idea that somehow grammatical structures form the, the, the skeletal structure, the bones of the language, and that somehow all we have to do is to drop individual words into these structures in order to flesh out the language and give shape to the body of the language. Uh, I think that idea is essentially outdated. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about why. Um, but yeah, that, that was the way I was taught to teach. So when I first read the lexical approach, and particularly one sentence that's right at the heart of the lexical approach, which is, language is not lexicalized grammar. It's not just grammatical structures that we drop vocabulary into. Rather, it is grammaticalized lexis. Okay, this idea that first and foremost it's lexis that carries more meaning, it's lexis that that drives communication, um, and that the grammar somehow comes attached to the lexis rather than the other way round. Um, this is quite a profound kind of shift of perspective, I think, and especially so because even to this day, I think the the course books that that sell the most around the world the kind of dominant way of thinking about what the job of an English language teacher is is based very much on PPP so you know the, the phenomenal success of a book like Headway or the sort of uh, you know uh, Headway Redux that is English File something like that 
those books are based very, very, very much around the kind of discrete exploration and exploitation of, of a very predictable sequence of individual grammatical structures. First the present simple, then the present continuous, then comparing and contrasting the present simple and the present continuous, then the regular past simple verbs, then the irregular past simple verbs, and so on. Okay? So it's you know it's a difficult thing to, to shake teachers out of. And if you catch me on a pessimistic day, um, I often feel that it's an impossible thing to shake teachers out of, that basically teachers are so fixed into this rut of thinking about teaching in this kind of way that it's it's difficult to change. But, you know, you have to believe that change is possible. So, yeah, when I read The Lexical Approach, it really sort of challenged my whole way of thinking. And really, what then followed was... I've often joked with my co-author, Andrew Walkley, that really we've spent the whole of our 20-year careers essentially kind of unpicking and unpacking the lexical approach and um, often we will think we've had a good idea or that we've sort of hit upon a new idea and then you go back and you realize that it's just essentially something else that we've we've managed to extrapolate out of the lexical approach it's a very very dense and meaty book I think that takes a, a long time to filter down into to practical classroom application for the individual but yeah, uh, when I first read it, when I was doing my Delta at Hammersmith and West London College, it, it really kind of threw my teaching into a state of chaos. And I realised quite quickly that I couldn't continue being a, a PPP teacher, but I, I didn't know what to replace it with and I, I didn't know where to go from there. So I think there, were, there then followed two or three years of, of chaos, really, in my own teaching. And out of that, slowly, some sort of lexical pedagogy emerged for me and my whole way of thinking about grammar changed very much but before I really go on to talk about that I think it would be disingenuous of me if I didn't acknowledge the fact that I think one of the reasons PPP this present practice produce paradigm it is still so so omnipresent and sort of omni powerful is because it's a it's a very seductive kind of setup uh, I think on one level, uh, particularly if you're an inexperienced teacher, uh, PPP makes you feel in control. You know, it's quite teacher-led. Um, Jimmy Hill, one of my old editors, once said to me that, you know, grammar is what makes English an academic subject. So it, it gives the teacher this kind of knowledge base. It gives the teacher this sense of power. Um, some teachers really love this kind of feeling of... of, of grammar power over the students because it's only tripartite there's only three stages to it it makes you feel in control um, it's tightly structured you know there's a presentation there's a practice there's a, a, a produce section but it still allows space for you to be creative you know if you want to you can do some ridiculous presentation uh, I used to do things like this. I'm sure many of you have done them. I'd come running into the classroom, panting for breath, kind of going, <laughs> and the students would say, what happened? What has happened? What has been happened? What is being happened? And I'd sort of go, <laughs> and eventually, if you were lucky, you might manage to elicit from the class, you've been running, and that would be your target sentence, and you'd lead into your grammar presentation of the present perfect continuous from there. You could also do creative practice sessions at the end, yeah, production sessions. So even though it was quite tightly structured and controlled, it, it kind of allowed you to be creative. And CELTA courses, I think, sadly, actually, encourage teachers to kind of indulge these sort of fairly lame creative urges we often have and to come up with our own kind of often fairly demented or simply just reinvention of the wheel versions of PPP lessons. Um, PPP also limits the questions you're going to get asked, okay? And when you're a young teacher, obviously this is quite important. Um, like lots of other teachers, I used to go home the night before I was going to teach and I basically used to revise the grammar notes at the back of the book for the page I was going to teach the next day and uh, sort of memorize them. So when I went in the next lesson and I did my presentation on the present perfect simple, for example, and 
inevitably the student would ask me, but why can't I say I've been there yesterday? I would just answer the fixed answer from the back of the book, you know. Uh, good question. We don't use the present perfect uh, simple with a, a finished past time expression like yesterday. And the students would look at you like you were the, the fount of all knowledge and you'd keep your job. But basically, that's the only question you're ever going to get asked about the present perfect. You know, it's, it's, it's quite a sort of limited damage limitation sort of way of thinking about the, the job of the teacher. And I think on top of all of that, it creates the illusion of progress because students and teachers kind of tick off the structures as they believe they've covered them. And you know, teachers are guilty of this as well. Teachers talk about, we've done the present perfect, we've done the past perfect, you know, now for the future perfect continuous, and then we'll have completed English. And for students, they often kind of you know, they'll buy Raymond Murphy's English Grammar in Use and they'll work their way through it twice. They'll do it once in pencil, they'll rub all the answers out, they'll do it again in pen. You know, you, you may laugh, but uh, I've seen these students do this. I've seen them come to interviews at Westminster where I work and, you know, clutching their dog-eared copy of Raymond Murphy's English Grammar in Use. So it creates the illusion of progress, okay? but. I would suggest it basically doesn't work. Or maybe, to be more fair, it doesn't work as well as we would like it to, or as well as really it should, if we're going to continue utilising it as the dominant paradigm in English language teaching. Well, I get students who've come to me who've been studying English for, you know, six years, eight years, ten years. They come clutching their dog-eared copies of Raymond Murphy's English Grammar in Use. And we interview them and, you know, they fall at the first hurdle. We ask them, hi, where are you from? And they say, I am from, I come from, I am come from Brazil. And you go, great, okay. Whereabouts in Brazil? Ah, whereabouts in Brazil? Yes, Brazil. Okay, so already at the first hurdle, they've kind of failed spectacularly to use English in any kind of real conversational setting. And... It's worth asking why this is, given the many hundreds of hours of study that these students have engaged in. I think one problem is that uh, with PPP, students learn to talk about English. They learn a lot of meta-language, they learn to explain the language, they can kind of verbalise rules about the language, and this is different from talking in English. Okay? You think about it from a native speaker's point of view, most native speakers talk perfectly competently in English, but actually, unless they train to do it, they're very poor at talking about English. And uh, I often think there's a kind of almost inverse correlation between how much meta-language students know and how good they are at using English. Uh, I sometimes get sort of, I don't know, stereotypically Italian students or Austrian students stuck in my class at pre-intermediate or intermediate and they're obsessed with grammar you know they will not learn a new piece of Lexis until you've labeled it so say you're teaching an expression like that would be great that'd be great my students will be asking me is the blue perfect is that a second conditional is it is a subjunctive you know it's just a fixed expression it's just a common way which we respond to an invitation. You know, would you like to go out somewhere tonight? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay? And they're not happy acquiring that or taking that on board until they've tagged it and labelled it. At the other end of the spectrum, I get the, the Swedish kids and the Dutch kids who sail through proficiency, but who couldn't tell you what a, a reduced adverbial clause was, even if one bit them on the nose. Um, despite the fact they're quite capable of using these kinds of things when they're writing. Okay, so I think this is one problem. I think a second problem is the system creates a kind of grammar fear and grammar dependency, even though the PPP way of studying language is often the result of students' own failure, they nevertheless believe that somehow if they just did more of it or they did it all over again, they'd get a better result. You know, and uh, you start getting close to that apocryphal definition of madness that, you know, madness is uh, doing the same thing time after time and expecting different results. But students become kind of addicted, you know. 
If you ask a student to self-diagnose what's wrong with your English, what is it you need more of, almost always students will tell you grammar, okay? Because the system under which they've studied has created this kind of grammar dependency on them. Think more seriously than this is number three. Basically, when you're focusing on structures in isolation, which is what PPP does, you're distorting the reality of usage, okay? Because when we talk, we don't just use one structure endlessly. You look at something like English file and, you know, you get these mad dialogues. It's things like, I have a problem. What should I do? I don't think you should go to the doctor. You shouldn't panic. You should take an aspirin. You should sit down. Maybe we should go to the hospital together. You know, it's like 42 different examples of should in question forms, negatives, positive sentences, all crammed into one kind of conversation. Or 25 examples of going to plus verb with negatives and questions in one little short conversation. And no other structures, okay? And that's not how language actually works. I think on top of this, as well as just seeing this distorted reality, what it also means students don't get is they don't get to see how normal conversations develop. We're so busy focusing on the present simple, you know, where are you from? I am not from Argentina, I am from Brazil, that we forget to show students how normal conversations develop. And so they don't learn, you know, that the logical next question is whereabouts, for example. Think on top of this, uh, number four, you know, like all good things in life, once is never enough. Um, you know, repetition, repetition, and more repetition, to repeat myself. Um, I think part of the problem with PPP is it's based on this kind of blink and you miss it idea that we've done that, therefore you should have got it. But language acquisition doesn't work like this, basically. Students half get things, they can use certain structures in some ways but not yet in others. They might often learn things as chunks, so they might learn, have you ever been? And they might be able to ask that, you know, have you ever been my country? Have you ever been Russia? But they don't yet know how to do anything else with the present perfect because once is never enough. And I think finally, and I'll come back to all of these points really, under PPP model, and again, you look at things like, you know, sorry to pick on it, but, uh, you know, it's a prime example, things like English file. Uh, there's a, a very strong separation of structural grammar and vocabulary. And the vocabulary is often single words, yeah? And when we're teaching in this kind of way, when we're separating grammar and vocabulary, we're making life harder for students. And we're asking them to perform a kind of alchemy all the time. We're asking them to kind of magically put together their knowledge of structural grammar and their knowledge of single words and to produce something resembling normal English. And it just ain't going to happen. It really isn't. So uh, how can we abandon this kind of curse, this tyranny of PPP and move things forward to a place where we're sort of teaching grammar more lexically, we're taking on board the findings of corpora research about the way language works, we're taking on board this idea of language essentially being grammaticalized lexis, not lexicalized grammar, we're taking on board Michael Hoey's idea about lexical priming, and the idea that we essentially learn how grammar and vocabulary interact through repeated exposure to the two things in combination, in context, over time. And that each encounter that we have with a structure or with a piece of lexis or vocabulary reinforces our primings, our expectations of how language is going to work. Well, I think the first thing we can do is we can keep it real. Um, I realize this sounds a bit like a sort of MTV hip hop kind of cliche, you know, on the streets, keeping it real. But I think it's good advice in terms of, of grammar teaching. So I think one thing that we can do is just to make sure that when we're teaching grammar, we're always teaching grammar in real world situations. So we're thinking about what the grammar is really used to do, okay? And, you know, instead of teaching sort of mad sentences like, you know, uh, never will I forget holding him for the first time 
you know, or I don't know, these kind of mad sentences you sometimes encounter in course books. Rather than doing this, just always starting from thinking about what's a typical, typical, you know, not just a possible, a typical context in which you'd use a particular piece of grammar. I think on top of this, we need to be careful not to overstretch structures lexically. You know? well, this morning in my upper intermediate class, we were looking at the future perfect. And despite Chomsky, despite structuralism, with the future perfect, really, there's only six or seven verbs you ever use with the future perfect. You say things like, you know, I'll have been here 20 years next June, okay? I'll have lived here, I'll have been living here five years next June. I'll have finished, I should have finished by five o'clock. They should have done it by now, it should have been done by now. You know, basically, forget, do, arrive, yeah, maybe 10, 12 verbs basically you use with that structure. And I think it's important to remember that, that we don't generally use all the possible verbs with all the possible structures. Some structures are just naturally used more often with particular verbs and some verbs are just naturally used more often with particular structures. Think also as a teacher you need to try to keep your grammar teaching true to what you say and what you hear. So if you're looking at a conversation or an example and you're thinking, oh when would I say this? When are the students going to hear this? If you're thinking that, don't teach it. It's the wrong thing to teach I think. And connected to this is this idea of teaching the probable, not the possible, okay? And, you know, again, you think about how kids learn, learn English. Um, kids basically learn to extrapolate out from the input they receive based on endless probability. You know, they hear the most typical, the most probable sentences of English. So my four-year-old daughter will hear things like, have you finished yet? Have you started? Have you tidied your room? Have you brushed your teeth? Yeah, you know, have you put everything away? And probably she only hears 10 or 12 questions ever using the present perfect symbol. But out of these probable sentences, she learns to generate other ones. And this is this idea of institutionalized sentences. Really what this means is examples of grammar that are so probable and so typical that they almost become kind of like fixed little bits of language. And particularly for lower level students, this is really the kind of first examples of each structure that students need to start learning. So for example, students are going to learn will, all, and won't. Okay, of course they need to learn this. Maybe they even need to be told, we use will to make promises, to make decisions at the time of speaking, to make threats, okay? you know, predictions. You can tell them that, fine. But those definitions are basically meaningless unless they're rooted in a stock or a kind of stockpile or, or a store of commonly used sentences that students themselves have acquired and are able to use that the meaning sort of derive from. So at low levels, I think, students need to learn things like, I'll see you later, I'll see what I can do, I'll be back in a minute. I'll pay you back tomorrow. Ah, that'll do. You'll regret it. It'll be all right. I'll call you tonight. This won't hurt at all. I won't be long. He won't mind, I'm sure. It won't cost that much. And from this, they start to sort of develop a more coherent understanding of the, the functions and the underlying semantics of the grammar. Okay? So I think, you know, particularly at low levels, we need to teach these sort of fixed institutionalized uses of particular grammar structures. I think also, and as a course book writer, this is something I've tried to do to the best of my abilities. And as a teacher, it's something I think about a lot. Rather than starting from thinking about the grammar per se, I think really we have to start by thinking about the conversations we want our students to learn or the kind of genres of writing that we want them to learn and thinking about the way that they develop and that this has to start being given priority over the structure as a study of structures in isolation. Um, you know, just, just take basic questions. If you take something like, what are you doing tonight? Okay, present continuous for asking about the future. 
never taught at elementary, um, except in art books, <clears throat> even if I say so myself. But it really should be, because it's, it's a kind of institutionalised use of the present continuous. You think about how you answer it, all kinds of structures are possible, okay? What are you doing tonight? Well, I was thinking of maybe going out somewhere. Past continuous to talk about the future. What are you doing tonight? I'm just going to go home and take it easy. Going to plus verb. What are you doing tonight? Not really sure. I think I might go out somewhere. It depends. I'll see how I feel. Okay? Think about a past simple question like why did you decide to do that then? We often answer it using the past perfect continuous. Yeah? Wow, I've been thinking about it for a while. We've been talking about it for ages. So, you know, we just decided to give it a go. Have you been to see a doctor about it? Present perfect. Yeah, I went yesterday. Past simple. Have you been to see a doctor about it? Not yet, but I will. Don't worry. Okay? You've been to see a doctor about it? Not yet, but I've got an appointment for tomorrow afternoon. Have you been to see a doctor about it? No, but maybe I should. Okay, so you think about actually what we do with grammar when we're using it to have particular kinds of conversations. It's not rocket science, and by focusing more on conversation, you help students to see the interaction of structures with other structures and vocabulary with structures. Okay? And you equip them much more for language as a communicative act than you do if you're sticking to this kind of PPP. Okay, going to do a little experiment with you. Okay, I'm going to show you some sentences and I'll leave a little pause between each sentence. All I'd like you to do is to think about what level you would teach each sentence at. Okay, just think about your, your, your first gut reaction. What level would you teach each sentence at? You ready? So, uh, sorry about that. Uh, I'm guessing that because you're an intelligent person, it must be because you're, you're watching my video, you obviously decided that you could teach all of these at elementary level, right? No? No, okay, of course not. Um, the strange thing here is, grammatically speaking, it's the present continuous, okay? And in terms of level, the present continuous is basically elementary, yeah? But I'm guessing if, if you're sane, you probably started with what are you studying and maybe I'm going out with a couple of friends tonight. Elementary, pre-intermediate. Crime's getting worse and worse at the moment. Pre-intermediate. I'm doing an extra shift at work tonight. It's more like intermediate. Then quite quickly it becomes quite advanced. You've got idiomatic usage. You've got quite sophisticated collocations stepping up their campaign, denying him access to a lawyer. So this poses an interesting question. Okay, if all these examples of one particular grammatical structure operate across different levels, how can this be? Because in terms of the pure grammar going on here, okay, the grammar is simple. There's the form, okay, pretty simple, yeah, and there's the functions. Basically, only two functions talking about an action around now, one already started, not yet finished talking about an arrangement with other people in the future. In terms of the pure grammar, that's all that the grammar means, okay? But obviously, just knowing this and just knowing this doesn't help students say any of this, okay? You know, knowing how to say these things involves a hell of a lot more than just knowing this and just knowing this. And part of what this implies, I think, is that rather than operating in this kind of you know, one bite of the cherry or, or blink and you miss it kind of approach that PPP provides. Really, students need repeated exposure, day in, day out exposure to the most common grammatical patterns. And they need to see how the most common grammatical patterns interact with vocabulary across a wide range of topics. 
And one of the ways, as we'll see in a minute, that teachers can make sure this happens is to reformulate, to basically listen to what the students are trying to say and to show them how to say that in some kind of better way. And whilst doing that, kind of holistically or globally correcting their language, whilst doing that, to draw their attention to grammatical as well as lexical features of the reformulated input. I'll show you an example of what I mean about that in a minute. But I think also students need to do different things on different days to the same structures. Yeah. So there's no reason, for example, at pre-intermediate, say, why students shouldn't first just learn the question, have you ever been to? OK, plus place. They learn eight or nine different answers. You know, no, never. But I've always wanted to. No, never. I've never really wanted to. No, never. But I've heard it's great. Yes, I have. Three or four times. Yes, I have. I went there last year on holiday. Yes, I have. I went there two years ago on business. Yeah. Another day, they could maybe be talking about society and they could look at the present perfect again to talk about changes. So it could be things like, you know, unemployment has doubled in the last five years. Inflation has risen 10% since the last election. Yeah. Uh, crime has got worse over the last few years. Yeah. You know, uh, race relations have become, t I don't know, have become more tense since the Woolwich murders, you know, something like that. Yeah. So you're still looking at the present perfect, but you're looking at it in a different context, slightly different kind of meaning, interacting with different vocabulary. If we're thinking about topics like that, where we're looking at how the grammar and the vocabulary combined operate to help students talk more fluently about particular kinds of topics, that guarantees repeated exposure. OK. I think also, as I said, we need to start from thinking about how conversations work. And if we do this, it guarantees repeated exposure to grammar because normal everyday conversation recycles grammar all the time. You know, every conversation you have, you're looking at, you, you, you know, you're using the present perfect, the past simple, the past continuous, the present continuous. So more conversations in class, both in terms of focusing on conversations and teaching particular kinds of conversations, and also in terms of getting the students to have particular conversations and to reformulate what they say. It means more recycling and it encourages more noticing. It gives the teacher more chance to point things out. OK. One minute. Yeah, OK. On top of all of that, I think one final thing is don't teach single words. Now, words don't exist on their own. Words exist with other words and with co-text and with grammar. And if you're just teaching single words, really what's going to happen is students are going to bring their own understanding of how those words work in their own language over into English. And their primings will still be L1 primings. So, you know, students will still say things like, one of my students today wanted to say, um, when he was a kid, his mum told him not to leave the spoon in a full bowl of rice or a half eaten bowl of rice. And he just didn't want to use the word leave. OK, so he said something like my mother told me, don't remain a fork. Maybe in his language, he uses the word remain like that. Yeah. So he's bringing over the primings from his own first language because he hasn't learned the word in context of other words and with grammar. So I think we have a responsibility to our students to teach words with the grammar they typically go with. And some words go with particular grammatical structures more than others. Yeah. So, you know, something like arrest, it's often used in the passive. It's often used in the past simple. He was arrested. They were arrested. Yeah. Um, this kind of grammatical pattern that the word often takes is called colligation. It's like grammatical collocation. OK. And, you know, there's more and more research coming out about how words colligate. The amazing Longman grammar of spoken and written English has a lot of information about this. And I think what it means we have to do as teachers is when we're teaching vocabulary, 
we have to think about the examples that we're going to write on the board and try to show students typical, just absolutely typical ways in which the words we're teaching might be used. Um, here's some examples of what I'm talking about. Okay, um, This is from my upper intermediate group. We did some speaking recently. Um, it was a lead into a listening we were going to do, talking about social issues. And students had to rank some social issues from one to eight, depending on which ones they thought were most serious in their country. I talked a bit about Britain. Um, they then talked about the problems in their country. And as they were talking, I was picking up on things they were trying to say but couldn't quite say, maybe because of grammar problems, often because of vocabulary problems, almost always because they didn't know how to use the grammar and the vocabulary together to express their meanings in the most precise, most typical ways. And I would be writing this stuff up on the board. As I was writing it, I would gap certain words. So I would write something like, the divorce rate has R, S, over recent years, over the last few years. And then I'd say, okay, so it was interesting. Um, Xu Hong was talking about China, and he was saying that over the last few years, over recent years, you know, from 10 years ago to now, the number of people getting divorced, the divorce rate has, it's gone up a lot. So it has, that's right, rocketed. Another way to say it, anyone? No, it's soared. What tense is it? That's right, present perfect simple. Why? from the past to now. Okay, black footballers still dot 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 a lot of racist abuse. So people shout things at them, they make racist comments, maybe they make monkey noises, they throw bananas. The footballers still, yeah, suffer a lot of racist abuse. What tense is it? Present simple, good. Why? Generally, always, usually. And I'd continue like this, sort of eliciting things, yeah? You know, a lot of women get beaten up, active or passive? Passive, how do you know? Get beaten, past participle, by their partners, so it happens to the women. Some end up leaving, why ing? Okay, preposition ing, after end up ing. We've been investing heavily in green technology, what tense is it? Present perfect continuous, why? Investing, continuing, from the past still to now. Okay? And then I'd give students time to write and time to ask questions about these kinds of things. And if you're doing this all the time when students are speaking and you're reworking, you're reformulating their output like this, and you're giving it back to them as sort of refocused input, there's plenty of opportunity to encourage noticing and plenty of opportunity for students to be primed better to develop their expectations of how the language is going to work and more opportunity for them really to, you know, to, 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 to get to grips with the most common structures in the language. Okay, I think students also need to know different things about different grammar at different levels. And at the lowest levels particularly, really students just need to do plenty of grammar as Lexis. And really what this means is, you think about the first lesson you'd ever teach with an absolute beginner class, okay? Probably you'd teach the question, what's your name? Okay, you'd probably say something like, hi, I'm Hugh, what's your name? What you wouldn't do is to say, I'm not Dave, I'm not Helen, I'm Hugh, what isn't your name? Oh, you're not Michael. You know, we just don't do this. You basically teach them enough to do the conversation that they need to do, okay? Sadly then what happens all too often on elementary courses is after that students stop learning grammar as Lexis, they stop learning useful expressions and they spend the next 60 hours doing every possible mad form of the present simple, okay? I would suggest really that at low levels students need to learn a lot more kind of fixed institutionalized sentences. So for me, there's no reason why an elementary student couldn't, and I think they should, learn things like, how long have you been doing that? Just because it's so useful. You know, it, it's, it's, you need to ask this question a lot. And they can learn that just as a sentence. You can translate it, if you speak the same first language as them. You can explain it, you know, it means you, how long, do, that. You can drill it, 
how long have you been doing that? You can set up little practice contexts. You know, what are you doing tonight? I've got my Spanish lesson. Oh, how long have you been doing that? What are you doing tonight? I'm playing baseball. Oh, how long have you been doing that? You know, it's easy to kind of contextualize and practice. Later, when they learn and they're presented with the present perfect continuous, they have some foundation upon which to build, okay? So it makes the grammar easier for them. At higher levels, they need to practice grammaticalizing. So often choosing the vocabulary and choosing the grammar and trying to sort of put the grammar and the vocabulary together in typical kinds of ways um, and being corrected when they make mistakes. And they need to briefly explore more obscure grammar so, you know, some students and some course books seem to think that if you learn things like dramatic inversion, you know, never before have I heard such a story, never will I forget holding him for the first time, that somehow you sound more advanced. I mean, you really don't. You, you just sound like you've learned mad sentences from a course book. I'm not saying it's not worth exploring things like dramatic inversion. But, you know, we need to be very careful about the context in which those things are usually used. So maybe like, you know, letters of complaint, yeah? Not only was I refused entry, but I was also insulted by the doorman. Not only was my train delayed for three hours, but there was also a complete lack of, I don't know, food and drink on board. Yeah, so you, know, you can explore that grammar in a particular kind of context. You know, no sooner had I arrived than the boss announced the company was going bankrupt. No sooner had we arrived than you started whining and said you wanted to go home. You know, so you need to look at each of those particular structures in relationship to context and lexis. But really, what will really get students from intermediate to advanced isn't grammar. Really, from intermediate to advanced, it's layer upon layer upon layer of lexis. More collocations, more phrases, more fixed expressions, yeah? Finally, and uh, I'm sorry if this is a disappointment to you, but for me, this has been one of the things that's really kept me interested in my job 20 years down the line. Um, there's more to life than tenses. I think if I'd continued teaching in that kind of PPP way that I was trained to teach, I would have stopped teaching by now because I got bored. You know, you get so bored when what you're doing in class is the phone rang while I had a bath, the phone was ringing while I had a bath, the phone rang while I was having a bath, the phone was ringing while I was having a bath. You imagine doing that three times a year to three different classes for the next 20 years. It doesn't bear thinking about, you know, it, it's so mind destroying and boring. Once you start thinking about language as conversation and language as discourse, you start to notice patterns in a broader sense, okay? Obviously, structural grammar, PPP grammar, it's a kind of pattern, and I think it's useful to know about this and to be, to be aware of these patterns. At the same time, there's also conversational patterns, yeah? So things like, you know, where are you from? All right, whereabouts? common conversational pattern yeah there's also lots of little patterns that aren't really grammar and aren't really vocabulary but they're worth focusing on if you want students to become fluent users of the language so things like you know just because I'm single it doesn't mean I'm desperately lonely just because I'm a teacher it doesn't mean I failed at everything else just because I like football it doesn't mean I'm a hooligan you know just because I'm a man it doesn't mean I can't cook just because I'm English, it doesn't mean I'm cold and unfriendly. Do you fancy going out somewhere tonight? Do you fancy doing something tomorrow? Do you fancy going somewhere this weekend? Yeah, I'd love to. That'd be great. Oh, I'd love to, but I'm washing my hair. I'm sorry. We teach will, but we don't teach the language that often goes with it. So things like, you know, the likelihood is in all probability. The odds are... And um, we often teach cause and effect for formal written English, you know, therefore, consequently. In spoken English, we often do it like this. It was so hot I could hardly breathe. He was so drunk he could hardly stand up. It was so cold I thought my hands were going to fall off. I was so angry I could have killed him. You know, we have so before an adjective and then a result clause. 
all of these things basically are kind of grammar or lexicogrammar or just interesting patterns but they're useful they're good to be aware of they're good for us to make our students aware of and they keep us alive to language and they keep us interested in language um, Obviously, as a course book writer of innovations and outcomes, um, myself and Andrew, we've tried to make sure that we cover as many of these kinds of patterns, you know, structural grammar patterns, lexicogrammatical patterns, conversational patterns, as we can. And, you know, really, we have to then leave it up to you guys out there, you teachers, to decide if you're brave enough to make that leap away from the tyranny of PPP and towards a more lexical way of thinking about grammar or not. So thank you very, very much for your time and for your attention. Um, as you probably know, um, we're on Facebook. We're at facebook.com, Hugh Della, Andrew Walkley. And uh, I also have my blog, Hugh Della at wordpress.com. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Please feel free to post comments or post questions or whatever. Okay, bye.